very pleasure to be with you all. And uh, I think this is the start of a few days' program, so maybe we will meet up again. What I'd like to do is just start with doing nothing. So give yourself permission to sit however you like. You don't have to sit up straight. You can start if you want to. And allow yourself just to do absolutely nothing. For a little while. That's long enough. What happened, if anything? <coughs> your bodies were quite stationary, weren't they? Didn't move your bodies that much. What happened with your mind? Move it. Yeah? Did anyone else notice that? Mm-hmm. Mind moving. Did you decide to move your mind? Yes and no. Where was where was the yes part? Um, the yes part is to to try and stop it moving. Okay. So basically, even though you decide to do nothing, thoughts appear in your mind. Yeah. Thoughts. Anything else besides thoughts? Thoughts we will call conceptual process. What else happened in your mind? Okay, sensations. That means the awareness of the body. We will call those feelings. Did you experience any emotions? Mm. Happy, yeah. anxious, unhappy? Anything like that? Yeah. yeah. And then, are you aware of the fact that at this moment you are experiencing either a mood or a mindset? Yeah? What's your mood at the moment? Probably quite neutral. You're not in a bad mood. You're not in a particularly manic condition. So you've got that you're aware that you have a mood. And then you have a mind state. What is your mind state? Thinking of the next thing. So it's a thinking, anticipating. Yeah? Anything else? Aware of other people. Right, awareness. So it would be an inclusive condition. You're not trying to cut off. Yeah, anything else? Most people could maybe have a mind state which has some interest in it, curiosity, inquiring. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm trying to get to is the fact that at any moment, as a human being, you are experiencing thoughts, moods, emotions, mind states. All four of those. They may not be strong enough to be imposing so that you actually are uh, troubled by them, but they're, they're like fluctuating energy fields. And most of it rotates around conceptual activity, that is, thinking. So, if I said to you, how are you at this moment, probably the first thing that would come up is the sort of thing you are thinking about, then the sort of emotions that are occupying you. Those are the first things most human beings look at. What this points to is that at all times, 
we are experiencing involuntary activity within our own minds. All of those that I've looked at are involuntary. That means you are fundamentally out <coughs> of control. You're not in control of yourself. Have you ever had a, a big upset in your life? Where something has gone radically wrong, like perhaps your house burned down, mm. or somebody stole your car, or your girlfriend or boyfriend dumped you, something like that. What happens in your mind? Huh? It keeps going there, doesn't it? Whether you want to or not, your mind keeps going to that subject to that topic, to that feeling. And it's like it goes and it touches it. So if it's something that's caused you a lot of pain, emotional, psychological pain, you think, oh, I don't want to think about this anymore. This thought, this memory, this feeling is too painful. So you make a strong decision, I'm not going to think about it anymore, and within a flash, you are back there. So, not only do uh, thoughts and so on appear in our minds involuntarily, but we are out of control and we are subject to compulsive thought patterns. Compulsive thought patterns. Add all those together and you get the fundamental reason why human beings are unhappy more often than happy. Because if you had complete control of your inner environment, you would be able to sit down and say, now I'm going to be happy. I'm not going to have any painful thoughts. I'm just going to have nice thoughts. And I'm going to feel peaceful. You could sit down and say all those things to yourself, but it would not work. Your mind would go on throwing up what it's always done. Right? Mm -hmm. So you're out of control. What else do we say? We can add to it, you're neurotic, because what I've described is neurosis, and you're a mess, because you can't be what you want to be. All sorts of other things. A neurotic mess driven by compulsive mind state. That's the human condition. <laughs> so, this is the territory within which we train with mindfulness. So we can start defining mindfulness as knowing what is happening, why it is happening. Simple action of bringing the mind knowingly into the moment. <coughs> now, this seems very, very small. It doesn't seem a big thing. But it's actually the most powerful thing you can do. Because all these compulsive and involuntary mind activities I've looked at are driven by a mind which is surreptitiously doing things without our fully realizing it, without our fully seeing how it goes there. <coughs> Therefore, our ability to derail or, or redirect mind activity is continually being obstructed because the mind always one jump ahead. It's always got where it wants to get one jump ahead. Now, obviously, this isn't because some external force is driving you. Why is the mind like this? What is causing it? Why is your mind a neurotic mess? Why can't be survival? Huh? It can't be a survival instinct. <coughs> be a mess? To be thinking ahead. To be thinking ahead, okay. To want to control things. Control things? Uh, it's kind of leads to make sense of the sense making of some kind of experience that happened. So it's trying to make sense of our experiences. Habit. I think that's a big one. Who said habit? Isn't that, isn't that really what it all boils down to? We, we just have the habit of thinking. What were you going to say? Well, yeah, I was going to say it's like a mechanical thing. Yeah. 
So we're actually addicts. You know, if I were an alcoholic, I wouldn't be able to resist drinking alcohol. Or if I were an addict of some other form, I would always be looking for my substance and I would be taking it. So I would be a visibly addicted person. But when it comes to the human condition, what, what really emerges is we are thought addicts. We are addicted to thinking. We are addicted to emotion. We are addicted to sensing. And you know, you, are you all psychologists here? You know, they, they did some famous... They did some famous exper uh, experiments with sensory deprivation, didn't they? So they got they got volunteers, and first of all, they put them in a box of water at blood temperature, and then they put the box in a darkened place, and then they removed all sound. So as far as possible, they created a state of sensory deprivation. How long was the longest a subject was able to die in that box in a state of sensory deprivation without bringing the pa panic bell? How long? One person set a record. How long was it, do you think? 15 minutes. 15 minutes? <laughs> Three. Three minutes. That is how seriously addicted we are. If we're deprived of our substance for three minutes, we start freaking out. It's amazing, isn't it? Sensory deprivation. Okay, so to some degree, our mindfulness training takes us into the ter territory of sensory deprivation. And as we go there, what we discover is that because the mind is continually keeping itself in a state of distraction, a huge amount of our potential is continually being frittered away. Therefore, although we, we hear that our brain is capable of an enormous amount, apparently we only use 3%, don't we, of our brain capacity. The rest seems somehow to be wasted. So mindfulness is now going to move into that area. Yep. Should we begin to look at it? The definition I've given you, mindfulness is knowing what is happening while it's happening. So our training is to bring the mind knowingly into this moment and see if it can simply remain there and not become involved with thinking. So we've understood from the, the very outset that thinking will continue, at least I'll put it differently. Thoughts will continue to appear in the mind. So, we accept at the very outset of our training, thoughts appear involuntarily in the mind. And it's absolutely essential to understand that mindfulness training does not address that issue. We are not trying to control thoughts. Nor are we trying to get rid of thoughts. You know, one of the most horrific phrases that I've heard around mindfulness is, oh, you must get rid of all your thoughts. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever tried to do it? <laughs> get rid of all your thoughts. Uh, other people say even more horrific things. Make your mind go blank. Make your mind go blank. There, there is a way you can do that. There are two quite good ways of making your mind go blank. You know what they are? What are Fall into the head. A bullet to the head is a fairly reversible one. The blunt object would, would be a more acceptable one. Or a lot of alcohol. Which is why alcohol is such a pop popular substance. It relieves us from the pressure of our obsessive, compulsive thinking. That's why we like to get drunk. It gives us a little bit of a break from ourselves. So, most people are trying at some level to get a break from themselves. It could be through alcohol, it could be through mind-altering drugs, whatever. But basically, that's what is driving this business. 
So mindfulness is going to enter into this territory, but it's not going to require a heavy blood object to the head, and it's not going to require a whole lot of alcohol. It's just going to teach you that you can, through training, allow yourself to experience thought without going into thinking. So there's a clear distinction between thought and thinking. Thought, we've realized, is involuntary. Now, are you all thoroughly comfortable with that word involuntary? Or shall I explain a bit on it? Involuntary. Could you give me an example of something else that's involuntary? Huh? Breathing. Breathing. <coughs> Very good. That's also that's sort of autonomic. Reaction to taking your Yeah, involuntary withdrawal. What about this? <laughs> so, what it implies is. It is some form of reactive process that bypasses intelligent thinking. It bypasses our decision-making process. So thoughts appear in your mind without you deciding to have them appear. Without you ordering them, thoughts do not appear in your mind on order. They appear as a result of habitual forces that have been flying through your mind for a long time. So we are not going to be able to prevent the appearance of thoughts in our minds. We're not going to try that. But we're going to look at a separate factor. Thought appears, and when it appears, you know it. You realize that. So if I, if I said to you, what are you thinking? You would quickly check your mind and you'd, you'd know, oh, I'm thinking this, or I'm thinking that, yeah? What this immediately tells us is that we are capable of self-reflection. We are able to reflect upon our own experience as we are having it. Not necessarily only in retrospect, but in the moment of having the experience, we can reflect upon it. So I can witness thoughts appearing in my mind as they are appearing, and I can know that they are appearing, and I can know that I'm witnessing it. And this is why we can train in mindfulness. Because there are two separate activities within the mind. There is one where it is producing or experiencing the appearance of involuntary thought, feeling, emotion, moods, and so on. Then there is another one which is constantly witnessing. So it's like something passing in front of a mirror. You could think of the mirror as the witness. It always completely reflects what is there. But the difference is, in our mindfulness training, in our mind, the witness is subject to some form of manipulation by our will. So we've got the involuntary appearances, We've got the witnessing, and then within the witnesser is what we can call sense of self. So if I say to you, who are you? The response that would normally arise in your mind is, I am me, this is me. And that response would arise within the witnesser. What are you thinking? The witnesser looks and says, I am thinking this. So the witnesser is the one who says, this is me. What are you hearing? I'm hearing the car go by. How are you feeling at this moment? I'm feeling this down for the other. So the witnesser is the primary feature, the primary player in the mind. Now, most of the witnessing is happening involuntarily, just the way the thoughts are appearing involuntarily. But the big difference is, we can do something about the way we witness. We can't do anything about the appearance of thoughts. We can do something about the way we witness. So, I could be distracted. What that means is, the witnessing part of my mind is partially knowing what I'm thinking, but it might be partially 
just out of focus, dozy, sleepy, or it might be partially preoccupied with a background emotional state. That quite often happens, isn't it? For example, depression. Depression is a, 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 an emotional condition that begins to take over more and more of the area of the mind, primarily the witnesser. But I can be depressed, I can listen to something, and I can know I'm hearing something and I'm feeling depressed at the same time. I can know that I'm feeling depressed and another part of me does not want to be depressed. And that's all within that witness. So then when I'm, if we could carry on using the example of depression, if I'm in depression and I really start looking at this activity, I can see how my mind, primarily the energy within the witness is caught in a loop. It's caught in a loop that goes back to a point of pain. Even though I don't want to. The mind loops around back to a point of pain. I don't want to. I may manage to distract it for a little while. Then the depression subsides, and then I've got nothing to do, and my mind loops around again and goes back to that point of pain. And this is the fundamental cycle of depression. It's just a cycle where the mind goes round and round and round. And doesn't know how to break out of the room. This is the big factor. The mind does not know how to break out of that room. So it just finds itself forced to have it go back there. Now, with mindfulness, what we are doing is we are learning that we can actually make choice and we can determine where we are going to focus our attention. And that is the key to the whole thing. The key is not what I'm feeling. It's not even what I'm thinking. It's the way I am relating to the thoughts and the feelings that are arising in my mind. Okay. You all happy with that? Mindfulness is knowing what is happening while it's happening. And that the person or the part of the mind that knows is the witness. So what we do is we start off by creating a neutral point of focus. <coughs> neutral point of focus for the witnesser. We call it the mindfulness support. Traditionally, it would have been breath. Most of the traditional text use breath as the support. <coughs> what I found, however, is that Westerners, people like you and I, have such hyperactive minds that we start subverting the support. The support being breath. So you start following the breath, but after a while what you will notice is you're regulating the breath. Did any of you ever try that? So the books say, follow the breath. So your mind says, yes, I've got to follow my breath. So it starts following the breath, but then subliminally, it says, this can't be enough. I should surely need to be doing something more than just following the breath. So it starts to regulate the breath. And then you are following and regulating the breath. And then you're no longer being mindful. You subvert mindfulness into an activity. So we're not going to use breath. Unless you're very good at it and you've done it a lot in the past, in that case you can carry on. Instead, let's try using sound. Why should we try sound? What's the advantage there? We can't control it. Brilliant. And we are normally surrounded by sound. And even better, normally, meditators would regard sound as a problem, a distraction. You know, a lot of meditators think in order to meditate, you've got to sit in complete silence. I remember a family where the father decided to meditate. And the whole family would go into terror for the half hour of the father was meditating. <laughs> so, so quiet. Mother was always saying, shh, shh, shh. You know, go out of the house, don't serve daddy, he's meditating. And there was this kind of holy, terrible silence surrounding this mysterious activity. <laughs> so we don't do that. We use what is there to support the process. So sound is going to be your support. So the meditation is simply to focus 
on the experience of hearing. Now, I've deliberately said hearing. Why? It's passive. Whereas listening is active back into doing something. So what you're doing is you're creating a passive situation. That doesn't mean you become subservient to what's going on, but it means you are not needing to direct the mind in any way at all. You are simply the passive recipient of what the environment is producing at that moment. You are the recipient. And you use that as your support. So you don't have to listen, you don't have to think, and you don't even have to direct your attention anywhere. You just sit there and let it all come to you. And in doing that, it holds you in the moment because time is a phenomenon, I'm oh, sorry, sound is a phenomenon of this moment. Sound is always in the moment. So our mindfulness training is bringing us into the moment. We know what is happening, why it's happening. We know what is happening, why it's happening. Sound is happening in the moment. So if I rest my attention with sound, I know it's happening. I know I can hear birds out there. I know that just now a truck drove by and made a loud noise. That's all. No mystery about it. That knowing holds me in the moment. Simultaneously, thoughts will continue to appear in my mind. The fact that I know I'm hearing a sound will not prevent a thought appearing in my mind. The thought may relate to the sound, or it may relate to something totally different. I may be preoccupied in some way or something. So those thoughts will continue to appear. However, because I am focusing on the sound, because I have something that's holding me in the moment, when the thoughts appear, I'm less likely to become engaged and involved with them, and I'm less likely to become drawn away into distraction. You all happy with that? All right, so what does distraction mean? Engaging with what is coming out. Yeah, and what, what more? Reaction. Could be a reaction. Not knowing that you're engaging. That's the big part. Engaging without realizing, realizing I'm engaging. But the big thing is, the engaging draws me away from the moment. <coughs> that, is, that is the essence of distraction drawn away from the moment. So, if I'm not distracted, I'm fully present, and each sound, each experience, is fresh. It comes, it comes, it comes. And it's gone in the same moment that it arises. <coughs> but if I'm distracted, I take hold of it, it triggers a line of thought, and I go off into thinking. And then I will even stop hearing. If I'm fully distracted, I will no longer hear what's happening in the moment. I will just be caught up with all my thoughts, taken away to some other place. So we use sound to bring us back into the moment all the time. Thoughts appear. Mind wants to engage the thoughts and go off into thinking, i.e. distraction. I notice that, and instead of going off into distraction, I redirect my attention back to the moment I need sound. So the beginning training of my mindfulness is first of all, recognizing that these things are happening, number one, and then number two, continually training myself to bring my attention back to the moment I need to sound. That's all. Now, can you see that that does not require me to do anything about the thoughts? 
And that's so important to understand. You do not try to control your thoughts. You do not try to empty your mind. You do not try to manipulate anything. You are simply redirecting your focus. Moment by moment by moment. Yeah? Any problem with that? Do I have to stand and stretch and then we'll do it? Understanding the difference between hearing and listening. You're not going to listen, you're just going to hear. Whatever sound arises, you know it. You don't have to name the sound. your attention focused on the experience of hearing. Our thoughts continue to appear in your mind involuntarily. But your focus is nevertheless directed towards hearing. 